Hello, hello. Welcome to episode 36 of the Golden Question Podcast. In today's episode, we're going to be answering the question why it should in fact be called Build Back Government Better. So, of course, this is in reference to Biden's Build Back Better program. And my argument is it's not really building back better the economy. Uh, in fact, it's just going to be building back government. Um, and in terms of uh, a big government proponent's perspective, it's a good thing. So the fact that government's getting bigger means it's getting better. And a smaller government to them is seen as a negative thing. But of course, for us, the bigger the government, the less productive we are, the more resources that now have to be allocated away from the economy and to the government. And of course, when they're there, they're just squandered and they're not actually uh, making society better or helping the economy. Because again, by definition, they're being diverted away from the economy. So first things first, uh, the, you know, the false narrative, of course, is that government is the solution and a lack of government is the cause of the problem. And if, and what we know, of course, as I've made evident by many episodes, that isn't always necessarily true. Uh, or in fact at all, from my perspective. Whenever government steps in, the incentives are in place to make itself appear necessary. Government is never going to approach a problem from a standpoint of, what can we do to make the situation better? Because what if that solution requires them to step back a bit? They aren't ever going to do that. Whenever government approaches a problem, their solution is always going to be, what can we do to make ourselves justified in stepping in and and having more control and power in this, in in whatever regards to whatever problem they're trying to, uh, whatever problem they're addressing. So the incentives are there. Anytime, (coughs) excuse me, anytime government steps in, It's going to make itself justified. It's going to try to step in. It's going to try to propose solutions that further its own agenda. By the very nature of the problem solving uh, strategy that the government has, the government is, it, it goes against its own incentive to come in and say, let me step back. And I, and this is of course, human nature. If you're coming in to fix a problem, you're not going to say, Oh, well, in fact, the problem is just me stepping in to begin with or something that I've done, right? Government is never going to be never going to take accountability for its own actions because then it just it then disproves the whole point of having government come in as a solution, right? If government caused the problem and now everybody who is affected by that problem starts to look around and say, wait a second, what caused this problem? And so the government comes in and says, all right, I have a solution. The government is never going to say, I caused the problem, because then it defeats the whole purpose of it stepping in and prescribing a a solution. So the incentives are there. The incentives are obvious. Government is always going to say it is the solution if it comes to step in to solve a problem. It is never going to say the solution is less of me, because then why are you stepping in to solve the problem to begin with? So that's that. Uh, And of course... Biden and and Biden isn't making these decisions. He definitely has a team, uh, his administrative staff with him that's making these decisions for him. But many government politicians, both Democrats and Republicans, uh, in, in respect to a big problem that is on the news right now, that's uh, being uh, pushed uh, from the media, surprisingly, is inflation, uh, and so. Many people fail to understand why we have inflation. Okay, and there's several theories floating around. First theory is a new one that Biden just uh, sort of uh, said in in one of his recent uh, press conferences is that inflation is caused uh, first, you know, he there's again, there's a lot of different reasons, so they're not consistent. But the most latest one is we have such a prosperous economy that prices are rising naturally. And of course, this is this sort of goes inconsistent with 
or in parallel with the Keynesian perspective, right? In Keynesian economics, inflation is normal. You need to have inflation because it means growth. It means uh, uh, people are getting richer. But of course, that that's false, right? Keynesian economics, on principle, don't work because the the end game for Keynesian economics is whoever has the most money is the most successful, which of course we know isn't the case. If you're a follower of Austrian economics, which is the traditional economics, right? Keynesian came after what we would say is the traditional Austrian economics, um, and that of of course of Adam Smith. Um, what makes an economy prosperous? What makes individuals wealthy? Is the uh, is the amount of goods and services out there? Money is just a tool to help allocate those goods and services. But really, what makes someone wealthy is not how many dollars they have, um, not how many bars of gold they have. It's how many goods and services they have. Uh, how what's the access? And in terms of an economy, the access of goods and services that they have. And so the the production is most important and this is why they call it really and again it's it's a leftist term but what the left describes as supply side economics is is just economics you know you don't have to label it as supply side economics it's just what we call economics and that is the 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 production of goods and services is what makes or breaks an economy not how many dollars you have and uh if you follow the Keynesian route, it makes sense, right? You see all this inflation, you see the Fed printing all this money, you see the government trying to uh, help stimulate the economy uh, by producing all this money. And so everybody has more money, but we don't have more goods and services. All we have is more money chasing that scarce, limited, constant supply of goods and services, which is actually by, and this is really the the the, the interesting concept of 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 uh inflation is that it makes an economy less productive right when the government prints money not only does it create inflation and of course uh cause prices to rise but it also has a bunch of these other adverse effects right making government bigger because the fed printing money buying up us uh treasuries makes the government bigger it allows the government to access um uh debt not from the private sector, not from individuals, but just from the Fed. So it creates this demand of debt uh, for the government. Um, and it, and again, it causes all these malinvestments, right? People go to uh, assets that are more sensitive to inflation and are likely to benefit. And, and so you have all these adverse effects. This is the beauty of Austrian economics is that it explains besides the obvious effect, which is inflation, yet yeah, rising prices, um, but there's all these slew of uh, slew of other different consequences that occur as a result to uh, the the inflation of the money supply. And if you don't understand these, then you obviously aren't going to see what the problems of inflation are. Um, and so remember, inf- and, and so we'll go through some some of uh, some of these. Inflation, the definition of inflation is an increase in the money supply. When the Fed prints money, that is inflation. You're increasing the money supply. A lot of people tend to think inflation is just rising prices. No, rising prices is an effect of inflation. And it's one of the many effects, as I said, right? One of the most obvious effects is rising prices, but it still is just an effect along with the other effects. You know the malinvestments, the increase in the size of government. These are all effects. Inflation, at its core, and essentially what it is by definition, is an increase in the money supply. More dollars in the economy. Uh, rising prices is just an effect. So you know what's you know why can't we just attribute inflation to rising prices? Number one is because you're not addressing the root cause of the problem. When you see rising prices and you say, all right, we're, ha- we're, we're going through an inflationary period, if you don't understand that the cause of the inflation is an increase in the money supply and you try to solve it, then this is why the government comes up and says, wait a second, we see all these rising prices, we're experiencing inflation, let's try to put price controls, right? When you look at inflation through the lens of simply prices, your solutions are 
are concentrated in just that specific factor of inflation. But of course, inflation encompasses, as we've just discussed, many other different factors. Increase in the rise, uh, rise in, uh, increase in, in prices, um, increase in malinvestments, the increased size of government. And of course, the government doesn't want to address those other factors. It only focuses on prices, and so it can use that as a way to uh, increase power by saying, hey, you know what, we need to institute price controls. Or this and that. But if you understand the true cause of inflation, you're going to understand, wait a second, it's the Federal Reserve. The reason why we're having these increase, uh, these rises in prices is because of the Federal Reserve printing money. And so how do we solve that? Stop the Fed from printing money or contract the money supply. So, and this is a, a general theme that I might repeat forever when I'm making these podcasts, because it, it always comes up. And that is, in order to solve a problem, you need to find out the root cause of that problem. Not its effects, not its adverse effects. You need to go and dig deep and look at the root cause, what stems um, from that problem. And if you, if, and that, that is the only way to solve a problem. If you don't, a lot of the times you're just making the problem worse. Okay? Uh, and so... How do we have an increase in in the money supply? Of course, the Fed has been printing uh, trillions of dollars, uh, and you can simply look at their balance sheet right now. I think it's almost that, uh, or it definitely surpassed twenty trillion, and uh, it's having all these negative effects. Right? It's not only increase in prices; we're having all these mal investments. You can see Bitcoin, all these uh, inflate uh, these uh, yeah inflationary assets that are just skyrocketing. Real estate, stocks. Um, so it, and it warps the economy, and that's the way I like to use it. I, I don't know who coined specifically this term "warp the economy," but that's a good way to look at it. It sort of bends and manipulates the economy, and uh, the general economic term is it, it creates these malinvestments, right? It it makes people invest in different things that no, they normally wouldn't invest in under a normal, um, st- stable uh, economic environment. Um, and a lot of the time that's not what's best, right? Right now in our country, what do we need? We need production. We need factories to open up. We need an investment in production, but that's not what we're getting, right? All we're getting right now is investment in all these services, uh, in all these, uh, in, in real estate, um, and, and a lot of these bloated up, uh, industries that are already inflated. And then you have certain industries that have not gotten the necessary funds to grow. And so you could see how in, under a normal, stable economic condition, people would be investing their money in, in, in a variety of different in, uh, investments than uh, where they're investing it now. So that's really where the malinvestment goes. Uh, and in, in, again, in this case, we're, we're seeing the, the Fed print money um, and for the first time really ever is that the paychecks now are going straight to homeowners, straight to the, the, the populations. It's not being distributed to the banks by an increase in their bank reserves. And then from there, banks can now lend it more right now. It's just, Hey, send this money straight to consumers. And of course, what we're seeing is uh, an increase in the trade deficits, which have already been increasing at an alarming rate. And now they're increasing, uh, increasing even further. Uh, and for the first time, really, in a while, you're seeing some of some of the logistical problems of all this of all this uh, uh, pent up demand by the Fed. Um, you're seeing ships now line up on the coast of California, just waiting because our our uh, the supply chain really can't keep up with all um, of all these people uh, uh, and and their increase in demand. And what we're seeing is, of course, this shines the light into another problem of of the US economy and that is our uh imbalance trade uh trade deficits or or, or trade balances or the imbalances in our trade where we're importing a heck of a lot more than what we are exporting and everything the consumers want to buy now is in other countries all these other countries now are 
producing goods and services, uh, mostly goods, and they're shipping it over here. Okay, and of course, would it be giving them in return dollars? But that's a whole nother topic. But what this is showing you, right? This is showing you another problem, really, in, in, in the whole US economy, sort of an example of all the different things that could go wrong when you have inflation. And it's again, it's not just rising prices, it's a bunch of other factors. And so one of them is, of course, the trade imbalances, the trade deficit. Because we're printing all this money. We have a lot more money than we have production. And so people now look to other countries to buy goods from. And you know, even if we were, let's say, a productive economy, we, pro we had a lot of factories, we were producing a lot of goods, if we artificially increase demand to the point where it exceeds the supply in our country, then of course, consumers are going to look elsewhere to satisfy their demands and they're going to look to other countries. So Regardless of the our our uh, the lack of productivity in our country, inflation would increase uh, the trade deficit. It would create and accelerate the trade imbalances because the country can't keep up with the artificial demand that's being uh, propped up by the Fed. But of course, in the U.S., we're much worse because not only are we lacking the productivity in our nation, lack of factories, lack in the production of goods. We're further accelerating our trade imbalances by printing up money and now causing consumers more than ever to rely more on the, the, the production of, of other nations. And this is also, I mean, you could, from a government's perspective, really, this is a, a national security threat, right? What if your country now relies on weapons, relies on medicine, uh, relies on many government uh goods and services that the government needs and it relies on other countries for them which is just a scary thought to think that during especially with 3m uh with the, with the lack of masks how we're relying on on china uh for our masks that uh hospitals need to use um and that even certain government officials need to use so it's just really crazy to think that the U.S. can't even satisfy its basic needs, its basic needs. And that shows you how unproductive we are, how uncompetitive we are in the world economy. And of course, it's thanks to, thanks to uh, not only inflation, not only the Federal Reserve, but printing up money, causing all these malinvestments, making the government uh, increase in size, but of course, a bunch of uh, fiscal policy as well. With uh, you know the minimum wage, all these regulations, rules and regulation. Um, so another myth. Uh, so we've we've sort of addressed some of the major factors, and of course, I think that the trade imbalances is really a a further down the line effect that inflation has. So you you could really rank the effects of inflation. Certainly, rising prices is up there, probably number one. Um, but you go down the list, you see increase in the size of government, you see malinvestments, and then further down, you get trade imbalances. So there's a bunch of different factors, a bunch of different effects that inflation has. And people fail to look at all the effects. They just look at inflation, they probably just see increase, uh, the rise, increase in prices, rise in prices as the main effect. And the solution is never going to work because it doesn't address all the other factors. But once you do understand, wait a second inflation affects all these other different things, then we could uh, attribute um, a solution that affects all of them. And that is, and once you find out that the, the, the problem roots uh, stems from the Federal Reserve, the solution is simple. Contract the money supply. Stop printing money. Because at the end of the day, that is inflation. Okay? Another myth that's being promulgated by many economists and also our own president um, and the Fed chairman is that inflation is is transitory. It's it's just temporary, which doesn't make any sense. And I think anybody knows, uh, m most know that that isn't the case, right? If inflation were to be transitory, meaning it'll come and then it'll go, what is what'll be the um, effects of, of inflation leaving do they really think that we're going to go through a deflationary period do they really think that ri the prices are going to uh, fall that the you know th that the stock market is going to fall or 
or uh, you know the real estate markets fall or just in general, that do they think that we're going to go through this deflationary period? Because that's what it would entail. If inflation is at 5 6 7%, 8%, 10%, and for it to go back down, I mean, you're still going to have inflation, right? Even if it goes from 8% down to 7 you still have inflation. Yeah, you had it uh, negative for that year, but it's still net positive. Um, and of course, this still is misleading because as we know, the Fed has maintained that 2% is their target. And so that's where they're going to want to keep. Even inflation at 2% is still inflationary. So it's very misleading. Um, but of course, just we won't ever come back down to 2%, right? And, it, the, and, and when it comes to prices, let's say they're saying that prices are going to come back that still doesn't make any sense, right? If inflation is still, if inflation, let's say, is at 8%, and then it drops down to 5%, prices are still rising. And even if inflation goes to 0%, even if inflation goes to 0%, it's still, we're still at the prices we're at. So this doesn't make any sense. How can inflation be transitory, meaning how can prices return back to pre-pandemic levels while inflation is still positive or even zero. The only way for prices to come back down to pre-pandemic levels if is if inflation is negative, if we go through a deflationary period. But that is not consistent at all with the Fed's policy to keep uh to keep its inflation target at two percent. And in fact, to justify these increases in inflation because it's saying, oh, for so long we we've had inflation for below 2%. And so now we, we will try to keep the average at 2%. Therefore, we'll excuse inflation going up. Uh, and in fact, they right not only have they excused it, they've encouraged it. They said, no, we, let, we want inflation to be above 2% so that we can even out all the years that we've had less, in, uh, less inflation, which is just mind-blowing. Again, I don't need to really explain how ridiculous that sounds from an, from an argumentative perspective. But um, the the argument itself uh doesn't make any sense and that is inflation even if it goes to 0% still means that prices are remaining high where they are where they are now in order for prices to actually go down there needs to be a deflationary inflation needs to be negative the fed needs to raise interest rates the fed needs to contract uh, and, and return and obviously sell some of those bonds. But who's going to buy those bonds that the Fed is uh, the Fed currently has on its books? Nobody's buying them. The, the very fact that the Fed is buying them right now at an alarming rate proves that nobody wants them because of, of, of the, 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 the low return. So the Fed, of course, is, is not really the buyer of last resort, as they say, right? It's the buyer of only resort. It's the only entity that's buying up these these government bonds, which again I alluded to before makes government larger. Uh, but in order for the Fed to contract the money supply, it needs to sell their bonds, and nobody's willing to buy them. Okay, so they're pretty much stuck on the on on the the Fed's books, and the only way for the Fed to sell them really is to, of course, raise interest rates because then they're going to make sense. But right now they don't. So really, uh, the last thing I want to talk about, again, this this podcast is very inflation focused. uh, And I think, as I said, inflation is the root cause of many of the problems we have in society today. But inflation uh, is, is another, it causes a bunch of other, I would say, more societal problems uh not i mean yeah they're related to the economy but it's more um i don't know i don't know if i would say cultural but they're definitely a problem that that society gets affected with and and again the economy is very intertwined with society with culture and i think the economy is very important and a lot of people tend to separate the economy from society and culture um and by doing that, you sort of neglect the economy. Uh, but in inflation, and, and let me go back to inflation. It always, and I've said this repeatedly in the past, it always benefits 
the rich and hurts the poor disproportionately. Of course, inflation, as we said, is an increase in the money supply, and part of that is in, is the rise in prices. Now, an increase in the rise of prices, or just an increase in prices, I don't know why I keep saying the increase in the rise of, but just an increase in prices, really, uh, how does it benefit the rich? So let's answer that. It benefits the rich because the rich have assets. They have assets that can benefit from an increase in prices. Because, of course, they can always uh, sell those assets at a higher price. Uh, so they have businesses. They could charge uh, higher prices there. But not only that, really, they have assets. They have cars. They have real estate. They have um, collectibles. They have investments. Um, and so inflation benefits because it sort of gives the false illusion that their stuff is becoming more valuable and they're able to charge more. And they're able to sort of ride that inflation wave, right? Instead of uh, holding dollars and seeing their the value of their, their paper currency uh, go away, they can hold on to these assets that, of course, are going to are retaining their value, right? Unless they're, they're actually deteriorating, but they can hold these assets and sort of ride the inflation wave. So they don't, if they don't get left and dragged behind with inflation. Uh, and now who do, and who does it hurt? It hurts the poor. How do the poor get hurt? Well, they don't have assets. A lot of them are holding on to cash. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying that this is something, uh, there's something innately wrong with that. All I'm saying is when you have these artificial uh, government interventions, and, and inflation is one, uh, the creation of inflation, it, it will hurt these people because of these innate factors. And of course, as I was saying, the poor, they don't have assets. They have their savings in cash. And a lot of older uh, poor people who, who were poor and then they worked their way up and now they have, and now they have pensions uh, and retirement plans that are going to be paid out in dollars. They're the ones who have the most to lose. A, because... They're still in the dollar system. They don't really have the wealth to uh, to hold and buy assets, and so they're going to be left holding the bag. In this case, a bunch of dollars that are depreciating in value uh, by the minute. So they're the ones who 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 hurt who get hurt the most, um, and of course they're the ones who are really buying up a lot of uh, a lot of assets that they use right away. Right, a, a rich person they buy a car. And they could sell that car. They buy a house. They can sell the house. A lot of stuff that rich people buy, they're not really buying it in the sense that it's getting an expense. They're just converting their cash to an asset, and then they could easily sell that asset. Uh, and of course, a lot of stuff that rich people buy retain their value. Um, but a perfect example is is a lot of lower stuff, uh, lower priced items that lose their value once you buy them and you utilize them. Uh, you know, cheaper uh, priced clothing, cheaper, uh, well, all food, um, food, cheaper priced clothing, lower priced cars, all these things are really expensive. You buy them, you use them, and then it turns into scrap. And that's what poor people buy. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that's the nature of being poor. And so you're going to get hurt most once the price of those things increase. OK, uh, and part of another really uh, irony, in, I would call it an irony of inflation, is that wages never keep up with um, with inflation ever. Wages, you would think, you know, the, the inflation causes the, the rise in, in prices. And so my wages would also right? my wages, a price for the business that might also increase. No, it, that's not how it works, because inflation, there's a process to rising price there's a process to rising prices as i said inflation has a bunch of different factors rising prices is one of them but rising prices it's there's a there's a trickle down factor that occurs in that prices rise uh first in 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 terms of um higher priced assets and then it gets trickled down into wages really wages are one of the last things that can sort of quote unquote benefit from the inflation 
So wages will never end up keeping up with inflation. And you, and this is evident with a lot of the economic data that's out there. Compare inflation to wages, and they just haven't kept up. And what this does, as I've just explained, the problems with uh, inflation, how it hurts the poor and how it benefits the rich. What this does is it get it, it races the middle class and it sort of widens this this wealth gap. And this is what we've seen. And this is why a lot of socialists um, are right and a lot of Democrats are right about the wealth gap, how the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poor. And unfortunately, a lot of Republicans uh are in denial about that fact, partly for political reasons, of course, because they don't want to acknowledge that it occurred also under their tenure. So, uh, as the rich get richer, as the rich benefit from inflation, as the poor hurt from inflation, the middle class gets stretched out also, right? You have upper middle class who, who kind of benefit a little bit more, and then you have lower middle class that, that benefit less, but they get dragged down to 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 the, the lower uh, economic uh, scale. So the rich get richer and the poor get poor. And I, I was listening to George Gammon's uh, podcast, and he noticed that he rarely sees people in the middle class, right? He either meets people who are poor or, or, or like really poor not just poor and getting by, like poor struggling, or people who are doing fine and are just exceedingly rich. And he made the example, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure where he lives. I think he, I think, I don't know if he described uh, himself visiting Florida, I think. I think it was Florida. But he uh, said that, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you saw like a Lamborghini once in a while. It was very rare to see a Lamborghini. And now, he sees them like every every time uh you know he sees dozens per day and this is certainly true for for me personally right going out on the streets where i live in staten island you i do i i don't know again it could be just the confirmation bias but it i really do see uh more people struggling and more people just exceedingly rich um you I'm not seeing any more of of true middle class people right you you I'm either seeing someone who has a beater uh who's you know working at Wendy's and then going to McDonald's doing uh double shifts uh who lives in in a horrible place um and who's just getting getting by or I'm eating people uh, meeting people not eating people meeting people who are just exceedingly rich who just you know have have a collection of cars, have their house remodeled, um, and are just, you know, you would think like, how are they getting all this money? And of course, it's because they're benefiting from the the investments and the assets that they hold. Um, and again, the, 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 the middle class is really not, and again, even in Staten Island, it's not here. And, and the way Staten Island is, uh, the demographics of Staten Island are the North, is poor uh relatively and the south is rich and it used to be you'd have the middle of staten island which is middle class as you get lower that's where you get all the mansions and stuff like that but now you go north and it's just all poverty poor richmond all poverty and then you go south and then you're just upscale mansions uh just wealth littered everywhere and this again could just be me, but I feel like this is the case with um, many different cities around the United States. You're seeing this wealth gap. You're seeing people who are just stupid rich, as they say, right? Who just have so much money to blow, um, and then you have people who are really struggling. Um, and this is again another adverse effect of inflation: is that it widens the wealth gap. This is sort of a cultural, societal effect of inflation. Uh, but I would still say it's, it's economical. It's related to the rise in prices. Um, and uh, unfortunately, until Republicans acknowledge this, which they won't, you're, you're going to see people, Americans, look around and say, you know what? A lot of what these socialists are saying, a lot of the problems they're pointing out, rightfully so, 
are becoming apparent. They're becoming obvious. Republicans right now, when they get in power, they don't want to admit that, yeah, you know, that although this president is Republican, he's not doing uh, the best because because he's a Republican, they have to support him no matter what. And it's just it it hurts my mind to watch and hurts my eyes, really, to watch Donald Trump and him making and touting in his speeches about how great the U.S. economy is, how under his reign he was doing all these great things. The middle class has grown. People's wages have increased. Fat companies have been moving back. And it's it's like, how can you be delusional to actually believe that? And I see a lot of people, and it hurts to see a lot of people who I follow fall into that. To see Ben Shapiro come out and say, "Yeah, Donald Trump had you know did do these great things." Stephen, um, yeah, Ben Shapiro, Stephen Crowder, um, you know, Michael Knowles, all these people who I followed and I listened to, them, and they've taught me a lot about the United States, about sir, uh, you know, American principles, uh, American values. Uh, certain. I mean, I they did teach me some economic stuff, especially back before Trump was president. When Obama was president, they 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 rightfully so discussed a lot of the problems with with Obama's policies and how they were negative for the economy. Right? Stephen Crowder always brought up government intervention, government intervention, uh, business friendly environment. He always constantly said these terms. All of a sudden, Trump became president. He stopped talking about the economy. He stopped talking about economic issues, and now he's just really regurgitating a lot of the nonsense that Trump says. So it hurts really. And it, this is, of course, how, uh, an effect of us becoming more politicized, is that you don't want to acknowledge that your party uh, is actually doing something wrong because you're scared to sort of uh, disassociate yourself from that party. And you don't want to give the impression that you're give, caving in and going to the other side. But it's okay, and uh, hopefully I'm not the only one doing it, it's okay to admit that the party that you've supported is wrong, is doing something wrong. They've deviated away from their principles, right? The Republicans are no longer the party for limited government, limited government intervention, the free market, pro-business. Um, not, again, I don't like this idea of pro-business because, because when you say you're pro-business, you're sort of saying I'm pro-business, I'm not pro-worker or I'm not pro uh, uh, environment, right? Capitalism is not just pro business. It's it capitalism benefits everybody, um, and it's actually government that that sort of has the illusion of being pro business that comes in and and it ends up hurting everybody. So uh, Republicans have really deviated away from their principles, and Donald Trump was just sort of the the cherry on top, and it just proved to me that the Republican Party is no longer. The party that it was, um, and I, you know, if it when it if it comes down to it, and I have to vote between the two, if I'm just given those two options, um, I am going to choose the Republican Party. But it's not it's not because I agree with eighty uh, percent uh, of what they say, and it, this is a difference between what they say and what they do. Right, a lot of Republicans do say that they're limited government, but of course. The stuff that they do is not, and you just look at all the different stuff that that got passed under a Republican majority, right? The Americans with Disabilities Act, the Patriot Act, all these massive expansionary government policies. Uh, really sh- says, wait a second, this is not the Republican Party, right? They are sort of one and the same. One, you know, they both do the same thing. It's just one says that they're this thing and one says that they're the other. But they both do the same thing. And ultimately, it doesn't matter what you say. It matters what you've done um, policy-wise. So that's pretty much it uh, for this podcast. Um, we've sort of, you know, I, I did title this podcast, Why It's Build Back uh, Government Better. But we've, we've talked about inflation and... Um, uh, really, I think inflation, as I said, is the root cause of of the uh, the problems of the U.S. economy. And where does the root cause stem from? It stems from the Federal Reserve. And the irony really is the whole. It's really the irony of central banking, right? Central banking was introduced to the world uh, at the turn of the century as a way to stabilize the markets, as a way to 
create stable growth. Really, that's what it was touted as doing. And that was one of its main arguments. And if you look at the debates that we've had in the past with pre previous presidents and previous, uh, you know, economic, uh, part of the economic elite at the time, they were debating these things. And we've had nothing but that uh, ever since, right? Ever since the Fed was created, we've had nothing but booms and busts and periods of, of economic uh, of inflationary rate, right? economic expansion, and then economic contractions. Uh, well, the economic contractions are, it's an illusion of a contraction. It's really uh, um, an expansion in disguise. Really, we've been having nothing but inflation ever since, right? It's not like we've gone through these periods where we've actually been deflationary. But it just shows you uh, the, the the complete about face that the U.S. economy has has done ever since the Fed has been created. Um, and if you just look at prices before, uh, the Fed, and look at prices after the Fed, and you again you have to look at them. You could look at them in terms of dollars. Fine, you could do that. But you could also look at them in terms of uh, in their relation to gold. So really, you can look at the price of gold. Price of gold will tell you everything you need to know about the value of of the currency and prices. But you know, look at prices as well um, of of certain goods. You've had a lot a, a stable. Uh, prices uh, throughout the 1800s and ever since the Fed was created they've been um, on nothing but an upward trend ever since and that's really the irony that I wanted to point out is that the Fed and central banking in general has done the complete opposite of what their intended um, of what their intentions were and it really shows you is that really their intention was their intention really to create a stable economic environment I don't think so right Governments grow during times of economic uncertainty, right? Governments don't grow when we're when we're all economically uh, prosperous and we're doing well. Uh, governments grow during times of poverty, during times of economic stagnation. That's when governments grow. And and this idea that the government would say, "Hey, let's create a Federal Reserve to help better the economy," is just laughable, right? They know why you know governments know why they institute central banks, right? It's they they're both working hand in hand. The central bank helps promulgate government the government agenda, and the more the 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 central bank slowly destroys the economy, the bigger government gets. Thanks for listening, and I hope to see you guys in the next episode.